everyone. I'm Matthew Gore from lightandmatter.org. With this lens comparison video, I'll be looking at a couple of prime lenses, the Canon 35mm f1.4L and the impressive new Sigma 35mm f1.4 art series lens, which has received good enough press that I decided to get a copy from borrowlenses.com and give it a good testing myself. Before we get into the details though, let me just say that these are both very well-built lenses, though for once it's the Canon lens that feels a little more cheap, and the Sigma that is a little more solid. The Sigma is not weather-sealed, but neither is the Canon. Neither one has image stabilization, and they're about the same size, but the Canon's a little lighter due to the liberal use of plastic in its construction. But the plastic didn't help keep the price down. The Canon costs over $1,300, while the Sigma, with its metal body, costs about $900. So, are those Canon optics worth the extra $400? We'll take a look at that in a moment, but first, let's see how the lenses sound when focusing. For comparison, here's a lens that just about everybody's familiar with, the Canon 50mm f1.8 with a standard micro motor. It's a little noisy. And one more time for good measure. And now here's the velvety smooth focusing of the Sigma, recorded at the same level. Let's try that again, see if you can hear it. Now here's the Canon. It's also nearly silent in most situations. If you listen closely, though, you can hear the sound of plastic sliding against plastic. It's not bad, and it actually sounds a little faster than the Sigma, but it doesn't have that polish you'd expect from an L-series lens. But these are minor details. To test the important part, the optical quality, I started by taking a stroll down to the Seattle waterfront to take some test shots. I used the same testing methodology as usual. I shot with my 5D Mark III from a tripod with the mirror locked up. I used a remote release, shot RAW, and didn't apply any lens corrections or sharpening in Adobe Camera Raw. As usual, if you'd like to take a look at some of the RAW files yourself, you can download them in the accompanying article at Light and Matter. The link is in the description below. So let's take a look at how these lenses perform at f1.4. The first thing that I noticed here was that wide open, the Canon produces some very strong chromatic aberration. This is most obvious around the high contrast edges, like along the white window frames here on the aquarium. There's some very serious magenta fringing. It actually looks better here in the video than in Photoshop. This is bad and really somewhat rare in the center of an image like this. Away from the center, things still look a little sharper on the Sigma side, but mostly it's pretty close, except for the fringing. Up here in the corner, especially on the top railing of the building in the upper left, the Sigma clearly provides higher resolution and more contrast. At f2, the Canon still shows some really strong color fringing in the center, but it also seems a bit more contrasty. A little further away from the center, things are still about the same, with the Sigma a bit sharper. But it's not a very significant difference, and up in the corner, things still haven't really improved for the Canon. At f2.8, the fringing is pretty well controlled on the Canon side, but it is still visible along the most contrasty edges. A bit more towards the edge here, things are close. There's really no significant difference, and up in the corner, things look just about equivalent. Certainly stopping down another stop would remove any shadow of doubt, but I'd be happy with either lens with an image like this. Let's take a look at another image, just to be thorough. In this shot, even in the center, the Canon shows some strong chromatic aberration again, though on this particular corner, the Sigma also gives us a little bit. Moving away from the center, the Sigma is noticeably sharper and more contrasty. And down in the corner here, neither one is super sharp, 
but I'd give the edge to the Sigma. Notice how smudgy looking the yellow lemon is in both cases. At f2, the fringing is somewhat improved on the Canon side, and gone from the Sigma. Otherwise, resolution and sharpness look about the same. Further out, the Sigma is still a bit sharper, especially the fine details in the concrete, but they're closer. Down here in the corner, things are still not looking good for the Canon. Look at the round street light to the right of the lemon. It's still very smudgy on the Canon side, but it looks okay on the Sigma side, and the same is true of the lemonade stand. At f2.8, the smudginess is mostly gone from the Canon on the lemon and the nearby lamp post, but it's not gone from the lamp to the right of that. You can see some strong blue ghosting here to the lower right. If we look at that same area at f4, it's still a problem, and even at f8, where the lens should be the sharpest. This is actually just chromatic aberration, which I would never expect to see at f8. It can be corrected in post-processing, but correction does cause some loss in resolution. Putting the chromatic aberration issue aside, resolution for the two lenses gets pretty close by about f5.6 for all practical purposes, though it may be measurably sharper on the Sigma. In any case, it seems clear that the Sigma is the winner when it comes to sharpness, so let's move on to another aspect of image quality, vignetting. Vignetting, if you're not familiar with the term, refers to light fall off and underexposure around the borders of the image, which is a particular problem with large aperture lenses. Here's an image with no vignetting, and here's the same image with fake vignetting added on, which is a popular effect that helps draw the eye towards the center of an image. When it's caused by the lens design, it is something that can be corrected with lens profiles in post-processing, but the corrections degrade the image quality, so it's better to start off with a lens that needs less correction. So to check the vignetting caused by these two lenses, I took some shots of a plain white wall, a little bit underexposed. With no vignetting, the tones should be pretty even across the frame. These frames are turned vertically so that they fit into this video frame better, with the Canon on the left and the Sigma on the right. Starting here at f8, I'm considering these to have no vignetting. Any differences in tonality here are just caused by uneven light. But look what happens when I open up the aperture and change the shutter speed to compensate. Even at f5.6, we see a little darkness creeping in at the corners of the Canon but we don't really see any changes in the Sigma until f2.8. Check that out again. The Canon ends up with some shockingly heavy vignetting, very dark in the corners. There are at least two full stops underexposed. The Sigma also shows some vignetting, but beyond the extreme corners, the effect is modest, and it's really only an issue at f2 and wide open. This is another clear win for the Sigma. Considering that these are large aperture lenses, I think it's important to briefly look at one last aspect of image quality. The bokeh, or bokeh if you prefer. Either way, if you're not familiar with the term, it refers to the aesthetic quality of the blur in the out of focus portion of the photo, usually in the background. For example, here are a couple shots of a banjo player taken at the Pike Place Market in Seattle. If we look at the background of each, in the upper corner, you'll notice that the Canon produces a more contrasty blur with darker edges, while the Sigma's is a bit smoother. In the center of the image, the image quality is still about the same, though the focus is in slightly different places. Down in the corner, there's really nothing helpful to look at here. So let's move on to the next image. I decided to play around with the lenses in a local cupcake shop. Now, when it comes to bokeh, I'm not a huge fan or expert. Some people love certain styles, but I like different types for different projects. Either way, I didn't find much difference with these two images, regardless of how deep I went into the image. The differences are pretty subtle. With this image, though, there were more prominent differences. Near the focal point, 
things are pretty similar again. Where we see a significant difference, though, is in the lights in the background. On the Sigma side, the light bulbs in the background are maybe a little irregular, but they're pretty round, whereas on the Canon side, they're more angular and lemon-shaped. You see the same thing across the frame. The orientation changes a bit, but you still get lemons on the Canon side, and something a little smoother and rounder on the Sigma. But optical performance isn't the only thing worth considering. The autofocus performance is also an important factor. 35mm lenses are not what first comes to mind when I think of shooting sports in action, but plenty of us shoot weddings and other events with wide-angle lenses, so it's important to know how they perform. To shoot some action that I could get close to, I went to a local skate park. Let me begin by saying that compared to my 70-200 f2.8L, neither lens performed very well in the action department. I ended up with a lot more blurry pictures than I'd expected. I guess I expected the Canon to give me better performance because it sounded like it was focusing faster, and because of my past experience with Canon lenses. It turned out, though, that I got more misses with the Canon as a percentage. But it was close. I haven't run the statistics to see whether it's a significant difference. What I did notice with the Canon was this. For some bursts, I'd track just fine, and the first shot would be in focus, like this. But the following shots would be more and more out of focus. The autofocus just couldn't keep up. The Sigma also was not perfect. Sometimes I just didn't achieve focus in time. Both lenses, of course, were better than something like a kit 18-55mm lens, though. With the Sigma, I did see things like this series. The first shot of the burst was not perfectly in focus, but by the time the shutter released again, it was perfectly sharp, and it continued tracking just fine for the subsequent shots. Without spending a lot more time and running some statistics, I can't say for sure whether the Sigma really provides better autofocus performance, but it certainly is not any worse than the Canon. I'm willing to call this a tie, with a personal suspicion that the Sigma is a little bit better. So where does that leave us? I think it was pretty clear that the Sigma was the winner in terms of resolution and sharpness, and it was also the clear winner in terms of vignetting. With autofocus performance, I would say it was a toss-up, and of course the Sigma is the clear winner in terms of price. With bokeh, that's a personal preference, but the Sigma's a little bit smoother, the Canon's a little more contrasty. This means it's pretty hard to come to any conclusion other than the fact that the Sigma is the better lens and the better buy. People are always telling me, you get what you pay for. Well, that does not always seem to be true, and it's certainly not the case here. If you're skeptical of these results, though, or have questions of your own about different lenses, I do strongly recommend taking a few days and simply renting the lens in question from borrowlenses.com and settling the matter yourself for your own particular needs. There's a link to them in the description, too. Incidentally, with support from borrowlenses.com, I expect to be back next month with another lens comparison video. And if you'd like to see it, make sure that you subscribe to my channel here so that you get the update. If you have any suggestions for further videos or any questions, just let me know in the comments below, and I'll do what I can to answer them. Thanks for watching. See you next time.